Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast, the official podcast of Pineland, broadcasting to you from an undisclosed location deep inside Pineland, where we discuss faith, family, finances, firearms, freedom, food, and everything else in between with those who believe in living free and living out the values that made this country free. All right, welcome to the Pine Lantern Podcast. My name is Paul LaFaver. I'm here with my Ranger buddy, Mike Blackburn. Today is Friday, the 24th of March, 2023. It uh, looks like we're just uh, getting to the spring. Yeah, A lot more starting, pollen. Yeah, starting to warm up. Yes. Yellow pollen everywhere. A lot of uh, the rain, a lot of the uh, wind uh, is carrying up pollen everywhere, having a good time I've here already in Carolina. Had a, I've already had to mow my grass once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's the uh, the bad part of this. Starting to, I guess you know the grass kind of knows. That's yeah, yard work time again. Yep. Uh, today on our uh, on the podcast we have Chuck Ritter, uh, who was formerly a member of Third Special Forces Group, uh, barrel chested freedom fighter, and uh, you know a guy that uh, we've been wanting to get on the podcast for a while. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, today I really kind of want to talk about. Um, the Pine Land Underground, which was a podcast uh, that you were in, involved in. It was sort of our predecessor um, for this community. And, um, you know, what, what, if you would, just give us some background and some history on the on, on what, uh, what the, the impetus behind the Pine Land Underground podcast was, uh, kind of what you were trying to achieve. Um, and you made some remarkable uh, gains while you were at the helm. So uh, Yeah, no doubt. Why don't you let us know, uh, give, for some of the people that may not have had the uh, privilege of being able to uh, download any of those episodes, uh, of course, they're still yeah. available. Uh, just kind of fill them in. All right. So, you know, wrapping your head around podcasts, which I was pretty confused last year. I still wasn't big into podcasts when I got into that one. But podcasts are really it's the modern version of, of radio, if you really look at it the, the way it's 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 being done. And, and once you do a podcast and you release it, it's on every platform and it's out there. There's no taking it back. Um, so Swick had a podcast and it used to be called, it wasn't called the Pineland Underground. It was called Knowledge Wins. But General Roberson, he was the Swick CG and he told his, his PO team that he wanted a podcast. So they created a podcast, but um, they didn't put a whole lot of effort into making it good. So I think they published about 33 episodes and they're putting it on YouTube every once in a while. The editing was pretty shoddy and it was all very, very formal. There was no humor. It's just, Hey, this is, this is the person we're talking to. Here's the questions. Here's the answers. And then they put it out there. Uh, I think it was last. Wait, when was it? it was December of 21. I was asked to come on the podcast as a guest in January of last year, I agreed. Uh, I came on the podcast. And as we're, as we're doing an episode, they want to cover kind of my history because I've been shot a lot. Um, you know, I've had 30 surgeries now due to combat-related injuries. So they wanted to tell that story. And they wanted to use that story to reboot this new brand because they had done a couple episodes as the Pine Land Underground. They just redone the logo. But they wanted to make it into something that was actually worthwhile and so it's something that people would listen to because first of all it's swick who, who the hell wants to listen to anything about a swick and then why would you want to listen to this podcast because you're asking people to donate or give you know 30 minutes to two hours of their time and uh, man that's some of some of those episodes have great information but they're they're sucking your life away so i came on as a guest and we did this this episode and I was talking to the major that was put in charge of running it because the general pulled him aside. He's like, look, Bobby, I've, I've told these guys that I want a podcast, um, but I think there was some miscommunication. Like, I don't, like, yes, the, the measure of performance is they did a podcast, but the measure of effectiveness, you know, is it good? And the answer is no. You're going to take it over. You're going to make it good. You know, so I'm sitting down with the, the major. I'm like, hey, man, like, this, this podcast sucks. But I think it has a lot of potential. Um I'm going to come on. I kind of just forced myself on as his co-host and he was all about it because, um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of back structure to it. So we aired my episode and that episode took off. I had 181 downloads total 
right before I came on. And then after that episode, it wasn't long until we got to 5,000 downloads. And then we really just sat down and started building the structure. Like, hey, what are the SOPs for this thing? What are we trying to do? We did a bunch of target, uh, or, you know, audience research. Like, what, what, who is our target audience? And what do they want to hear? And how do we need to structure this thing? So we're like, okay, well, it needs to be entertaining, but it also needs to be informative. And it needs to, to, to sell what we're doing in the regiment. So we, we put a lot of work into just studying up on what it is that we want to achieve with it. And then we started lining up some what we thought were really awesome guests that that would hit the topics we wanted to hit. And um, we quickly, you know, went up like we just hit 91,000 downloads, uh, I think last week. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a pretty, pretty sizable increase. And it's just, you know, it keeps, it keeps going up and up and up. And right now it's, you know, it's, it's on hold, um, you know, due to everything going on in the regiment, the regiment wanted to keep a low profile, but I'm pretty proud of what we accomplished with it. And the, the sheer amount of people that reach out via email and LinkedIn and everything else. And, Hey, I, I really appreciate this episode. It really made me think about this topic in a different way a different form and uh that's been pretty awesome it's uh, every day you get two or three messages at least if not more on you know feedback from people and it's not just military people i'm talking like lawyers um there's businesses where the ceos have all their execs um almost mandatory type listening you know it's it's a vast array of people and you know you know one of the things is kind of recruiting is like well is that really a target audience you want like all these people have kids right just trying to get trying to sell the regiment for what it is, right? Like within Silla Ferris Op and, and SF, we're more than just kicking in doors and, you know, just, just running unconventional warfare. There's so much that we do and, and can do. Uh, I think it's important just to get those, those messages out there. Well, the, the, the other thing too is I'm, I'm just kind of curious because um, this was an additional duty, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, mean so... Is- but these things, as you well know, if you're going to put on a good show, if you're going to give these guys, uh, you know, the type of content that, that they're looking to, you know, like you said, invest their time in, um, this thing this thing can take on sort of a life of its own and really require quite a bit of time. Oh, um, yeah. You know, you were, a ton of time. Now, yeah, you know, you were cranking these out like, what, every two weeks? Every two weeks, yep. So we usually try to keep about four, keep about four in the shoot for editing. Um at any one time. No, so what kind of staff did you have and how much help did you have um, really kind of laying on your guests and getting, uh, you know, getting yourself sort of prepared? Because, uh, I mean, you're also, I noticed your shows vary. Like you, you mentioned, you know, you'll go 30 minutes or you may go a couple hours. Um, mm-hmm. It just has to depend on your topic and your guest. Yeah, even the ones that go real long, we, we cut a lot out of that. So they kind of seem like they're free form. I mean, some of these episodes we've, recorded completely backwards and it just comes out edited the way it does because that's what we're trying to mm-hmm. achieve right but um the staff was me bobby tuttle the other the other producer co-host and you know we started off with two editors but one of them he went on to bigger and better things so we had one editor and, and that was it you know we didn't even go to the, the pa office or anything we just um you know we got permission from the boss to, to do it ourselves so we really did all the final editing but you know it is in the off time so you know the day job i'm Deputy Tom at the NCO Academy, which sometimes we we cut into that for interviews and stuff, but the, the vast majority of the work's on your on your off time. But just prepping for an episode for the episode construct, I mean, you're probably putting about four or five hours into that when you include the pre-interview with the guys and everything, so you can construct uh, the proper format for what it is you're trying to achieve. And then you know, recording, you're generally in there for about three and a half, four hours, and then your notes to the editor, and then the editors go to the first round. And then we'll come back and, and really I was the guy that went back and did all the final editing. So go through the whole thing, give him the notes on what needs to be changed or cut, you know, he'll come back. And then as far as like publishing, like search engine optimization is, is a big thing that I didn't really comprehend. I put tons of research into that because you can really force the algorithms to make it to where when you, you know, if you type in Pineland, this is Pineland Underground, right? It's for, for everything from Google to, whatever you're doing but there's very specific things you have to do which aren't very intuitive but just going through making sure that the youtube write-ups right the stuff on simple cash is right and that you're really repeating your keywords uh, the requisite number of times so it forces the algorithm to do what you want but just the research goes into that and then you know the publishing you know if we're releasing on a tuesday 
That means that Sunday I'm probably until midnight editing and the next day putting another four hours into the final stuff and making sure everything's good on the outlets and making sure our marketing strategy for how we're going to release on social media is correct and then making sure it's all coordinated and popping up. It's, you know, 10 to, 4, 10 to 20 hours a week, easy. Um, 20 hours on an off week, which sounds backwards, but that's because you're prepping for everything. And then 10 hours on the week you release, because once you release, you know, you're taking a small break that week for at least a couple of days. Um, but yeah, it's very, I mean, you guys know it's, it's a lot more time intensive than you would think it is. If you don't have a staff, I mean, the SOCOM podcast, the softcast, they got, a, they got like five or six people that just, that's what they get paid to do. That's right. <clears throat> well, see, now I have my ideas of the value uh, of this thing. Um, and my idea is, at least my thoughts on this are, I think it's very easy to sort of get in your, your team room, if you will, sort of get into your, your bubble. Uh, whatever it is that you're doing within the community, um, you really have very little visibility uh, of what's kind of going on uh, in, in the other hallway or the other building or the other group or anything else. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I, to me, the real value of of these podcasts uh, for the community is really this may be the only opportunity a guy really has. Uh, to really kind of hear what's going on and, and what the bigger picture is and what the bigger uh, trends are that are happening within the soft community. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, that's definitely one of the things that we're trying to do where, okay, let's let's bring a really talented civil affairs guy and a science person. Let's tell the other side of the story of, of special forces where we're bringing people in that can tell the whole gambit of everything that we do besides just, you know, because direct combat's like, a very small portion of what we do is, is Green Beret, but telling the story of all that other stuff, it's seemingly non-sexy, but I find it to be incredibly awesome. Um, the things you get to build as a, as a special operations person, and you're right, like, tell those stories, get those stories out there, because, you know, most books you pick up is all the cool stuff, right? It's But all the other stuff I think is incredibly cool, too. It's just, I don't know, we just never market it, and we never really tell those stories. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with the quiet professionalism, I think, and uh, the the sort of uh, compartmentalization of of the community, uh, where a lot of times the left hand is the left hand is purposely not really supposed to be knowing what the right hand's doing. But um, besides that, what challenges did you uh, run into? Just you know, this is an active duty podcast. I mean, uh, it's it's kind of a a new forum, a new venue a new way of communicating to the community. Uh, and I think there's some, to me, there's some challenges doing that. There's some challenges, definitely risk too, right? I mean, we, <clears throat> we did a very deliberate risk assessment because, you know, we weren't going to the PA office. So like everything from cussing to everything else, like this is very deliberate. Like there's nothing in an episode that's not there for a reason, right? Um, we want to get away from your normal, military very like almost public service announcement type of podcasts that are out there or the stuff that, that most of your you know official entities are pushing out because we wanted to make it relatable um and hey we're people yeah it's an e9 and a major but you know we put our pants on the same way as anybody else and everybody we talk to is also just a human being and, and it's it's relatable but it also it's authentic right we're not trying to blow smoke up anybody's ass or do anything that, that we're just trying to push a narrative um, for the military, we're trying to have a real conversation with people with experience and and have a discussion. Um, yeah, and there is heavy editing. It's not maybe as as free form as it would seem when you listen to it, right? Like, um, there's definitely a lot of things cut out or, or rearranged sometimes to get the effect we want. But um, that's really what we're going for: something completely different than what you'd hear. Like, we're tired of hearing this, you know, the AFN commercial type stuff where it's somebody just just throwing a bunch of words at you like no let's let's have a military podcast the only one probably that's super authentic and real but yeah the challenges with that is everybody's scared of it right and then so we did a lot of work with um you know the documents we provided the general was it was a huge briefing on all of our research which is really in depth of you know these are the audiences this is why we're constructing these episodes the way we are this is how we choose our topics these are you know everything that goes into it all the equipment we need that we have, you know, a CCR agreement, like, hey, these are the things we're going to report to you, but here's the information we need. Uh, here's a very deliberate risk assessment, and here's how we're going to mitigate these risks, because 
you know, there's no regulation on a podcast right now. It's one of the, the few platforms there's, there's no regulation on. So you can really almost put whatever you want out there. And then once you hit submit on whatever uh, publishing service you're using, and it goes out on all those platforms, it, it's out there. There's Even if you delete that episode, it is still out there. So whatever you put out in the ether, it's, it's done. So that is risking itself. There's no take backs once you publish something. Um, you know, and you know, and people did have problems with it. Um, you know, probably one of the reasons why it's not on the air right now. Um, but that's that's kind of what it is. But it's always a risk that we knew. Or, you know, our joke was that at some point in time, the army's going to shut this thing down. So, well, it's only, always a risk. It was only a, a matter. It was only a matter of time before UPA uh, discovered your undisclosed broadcasting location, Chuck. So, <laughs> um, something. Hey, listen. Um, what was what were some of your favorite episodes? Oh man, um, like right now, our best, our, our top episodes is one of the last ones we did with uh, a guy named Chewy Almonte, who's a, a command sergeant major over in the special activity or the uh, special skills battalion over at SWIC. He's about to take over selection as a, a sergeant major out there before he gets out. But uh, I'm not sure if that's my favorite one. That one's really good. Though talking about leadership but my favorite one is one that we might we didn't air we went with hendrick motorsports recently recorded one with their um, all the people in their three their three teams that you know they're the most winningest nascar um competitive entity in existence and we we sit down and talk to them about you know what makes a winning team and and you know the crossover between how they think and and how the military thinks because I mean they, they run a selection process for their pit crew. They have 120 people that come in, and they might select 12 of them. It looks very much like a, a military process uh, going through this stuff. But that was that one was was really incredible. But there's been so many fun ones. We had you know John Wayne Troxel on one of them. That was that was really that, that guy was just inter- really awesome. He's the he's the former uh, SEAC. He actually got suspended because um, he gave a speech about how even with technology we still need to be prepared to, to grab an e-tool and bash an enemy's head and if we have to like you got to be maybe on both sides of the spectrum right you, yeah you got to embrace technology but also combat's brutal and unforgiving and we can't get away from the fact that you know war is what it is and he has to spend it for a little bit but they put him back in, in place but he's just an awesome guy that one that one was really really fun but you know we brought in an irish guy uh, named kevin owens and he just told his special forces story and that guy he started out in the Irish Army. He was an Irish Special Forces guy. And then he got out. He was a mercenary in Mogadishu for a number of years. And then he came over to America and joined the American Army and, and went to um, the Q course. And me and him went to the Q course together. That's how I knew him. Uh, but he just, got, he just has an amazing story. Um, he was over in 2nd Battalion, 3rd Group. Uh, that was the CRIF. And, uh, that was one of our most popular episodes for a while. That was super fun to record. And then uh, that one's got just got surpassed recently by a number of other ones. Yeah, uh, Chuck, I really wanted to get at uh, maybe you could just share some of the highlights. Uh, you know, I was privileged to watch the uh, Black Rifle Coffee uh, episode uh, where you were, this was, you know, probably uh, not too long ago. You just talked about, you know, uh, being in the fight, being surrounded, uh, you know, what that was like. And maybe just some highlights of that. <clears throat> oh, like that actual incident from the, the the video that that little documentary. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how I got invited on the podcast, right? Because of that that story. Um, so in that story here, it's kind of cliff notes. It's twenty minutes, right? But it goes over in two thousand eight. Uh, I was in an IED blast that killed a number of people, and I was severely wounded. That took four years to recover from. I had to relearn how to walk again. I had my face reconstructed. I didn't have front teeth for for four years. I looked like a like a hockey player, a hillbilly. Um, but I got cleared for duty in 2012, I believe. I actually snuck into a deployment. I snuck into a deployment in 2010, and my battalion CSM, maybe it was group CSM, Mark Eckert at the time, he brought me as a chuck. So I got, you know how I know you're not actually medically cleared for duty, and you lied on your, your paperwork. I was like, uh, I was like, well, for one, you don't have any front teeth. But two, <laughs> I called your surgeon and your site, and they said that there's no way you're supposed to be deployed. You still have four more surgeries left. It's like, so I'm not going to kick you out of country, but when you get back, you're banned from deploying until I get a letter from each one of those 
your surgeon, then your psychs in, and you're cleared for duty. You know, because I had a bunch of brain damage. Mm -hmm. I had to go through a bunch of cognitive therapy. But anyway, so I did get cleared for duty. Um, took over as a team sergeant for a team. We deployed, and uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we had an Afghan commander that had gotten shot, and uh, most most of the other commanders had run away. And I was trying to call in some air on the far side of where this, this open air was going to get shot. But the Apaches, that they're, both their guns just were inoperable for some reason. I mean, they had been firing before that. Something happened. They wouldn't work. And it just happened to be at the perfect time where we had no other aircraft in the Raws because it was refueling. And we had A-10s probably about 10 minutes out. Uh, and we knew the Taliban was going to get this guy. So I just made the decision. Like, man, we got to go out. We got to fight out. We got to at least grab this dude and bring him around the corner of us. Taliban's going to snatch him up, and that's that's mission failure for us. So um, we're probably going to get our asses handed to us out there. And so we go around the corner. If I actually listen, like the actual helmet cam footage, the whole thing is actually on my YouTube page. You can listen to you right. know, me get my ass handed to me going around the corner. But we're dragging, we're dragging this guy down. I got him getting shot three times with a PKM. Mm. Um, so I ended up getting better backed out, and. Uh, actually crashed in the operating table a couple times due to blood loss when uh, I got a shot I broke through the brachial artery and the brachial nerve complex in my back and the, the bullet actually traveled down my back and lodged in my lower near my spine um, but they used hexton on me on the battlefield uh, which they don't use it anymore but what it would do it basically force all your fluids into your bloodstream so your blood pressure would stay good so when I got to the hospital uh, my blood oxygen levels were just nothing and I couldn't figure out how I could crash and my blood pressure was good. So the first surgery they did, they, they didn't even knock me out. They gave me ketamine, but they didn't give me enough ketamine. So I felt, I couldn't move, but I felt that surgery. That, that sucked. Um, and went there and fixed the artery. And then yeah. came back, had to relearn how to use my arm. My arm wouldn't work. And they're like, there's no way you're coming back. I was really high on, on pain meds one night. I was drinking, and I probably shouldn't have, and I called the group sergeant major, uh, Brian Rary. And I was like, look, he's like, I'm coming. I was like, I'm coming back. Unless you put a guard at every civilian airport, you can't stop me. I, I think he actually told me to go fuck himself, too, is the way he told it. And uh, <laughs> I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Baltimore. I'm going to catch a civilian flight to Germany. I'm going to give myself seven days of paid vacation, hang out there, and have a good time. And I'm going to catch a better back burden there in the um, bottom. And that's exactly what I did. And I got off the plane. Him and the, the group commander were super pissed. Um, but they're like, hey, man. This is pretty jacked up, but it's a good testament to the Thor 3 program that we got showing that, you know, what it can do to recover guys. And it probably won't look good if we if we get in trouble. So you can hang out, but you can't get back on a combat mission. And I'm sneaking back in on a combat mission anyway. It was the last mission. Uh, they weren't very happy about that either. Snuck in on the con op and went out on that one. Um, came back and then the next year we're back in Afghanistan. I'm taking a PKM around through the hand through the middle knuckle blew up the bones up the side and uh um ended up staying in the, in the fight all day that day we're trying to call a medevac bird in but that was a while we landed in the middle of the day and mi-17s like we had an afghan we had three afghan companies pinned down all morning and we, were, we weren't with them and uh i was taking a shower i love to take a shower and the afghan commander came in our battalion commander was like hey chuck where's your team leader I was like, well he's in the shower I was like, okay let's Let's run you through what we're thinking. We're, we've got three Afghan companies. One of them is an armored company, and they've been pinned down all morning. I'll show you the video. Like, These guys are about to get wiped out. Mm. Um, we want to send you guys in in the middle of the day, and my 17s, and we want you to take these 21 Afghans over here that they didn't take because they're dangerous and they didn't want to take one injector. Um, what do you think? And I was like, oh man, it sounds really stupid. Um, <laughs> so the team leader came out of the shower. Uh, I briefed him through it. I was like, man, this is like a suicide mission. This is like probably the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I was like, but we're Green Berets. And if we don't go get these dudes out, like we're going to screw up the entire game plan for the next two weeks. Like that is our, that is our element. Like we've completely screwed up the entire Kundu's hmm. operation. If we just like, so this is dumb, but I recommend we go in there. And I was like, all right. So we went back. I planted the HLZs. And right when we landed, it was, you know, you could start, you could see uh, daylight coming through holes in the top of the choppers. Uh, but the Apaches had said, hey, the HLZ is clean. So that was pretty surprising. And then we got off. It turns out the uh, the Apaches were on the wrong HLZ. So the HLZ they were looking at was clean, but ours definitely wasn't clean. 
and it was yeah, it was pretty wild. Yeah, and the uh, now you mentioned uh, uh, Thor and you know some of the ways that you got back. I mean, you've been hurt a lot, and you've been injured a lot, and uh, you know something I like to ask guys. Uh, I've I've been hurt also, and just kind of get back in the fight. You know, uh, what something they call post traumatic growth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just simply, you know, what you go through uh, to transform, to kind of go from where you're at, broke, hurt, your, where your mind is, and to get back to the place where you can get back into the show. I mm-hmm. mean, could you just talk about that, like um, where you went in your mind and what you had to grapple with to, to just kind of get to a place that, uh, you know, that you were to be, your mind was right prior to going back in. Um, it's, it's an interesting one because I think my mind works a little bit differently than most people. So the first time I got hurt, we didn't have those programs. Right. And then the second time I got injured, when I got shot, we did have those programs. And I remember the first time, you know, we only had one, one psychiatrist for the entire group. I think if I remember correctly, um, and then I had a bunch of brain damage at the time too. So I don't remember besides going to Womack and going through their cognitive therapy program, there wasn't a whole lot of emphasis on like the mental recovery piece or we didn't have any physical therapists at the time either. Right. So you went to Womack right. physical therapy. And I think why the one, the one reason why it took me so long to recover then is because, you know, the green berets were pretty dumb. Um, I remember one day I had a, a bone graft in my mouth and they had taken all my wisdom teeth and they cultivated a bunch of bone from the front and they were rebuilding the top of my jaw. And for some reason I called my buddy, a guy named Rich Cohen. He's like this, he's just a stud. And he's like 10 years old and he's always a stud. But I was like, hey, man, you want to do this 12 mile lift march? He's like, didn't you have surgery? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. He's like, all right. Yeah, that was real <laughs> stupid. Um, and actually jacked up the bone graft. So uh, blood pressure. I think I passed out on the, on the rock. There's stuff like that, right? Like, yeah. But that's the type of stuff we do. Um, and you get in your own way. You know, so it took me a long time to recover. But fast forward now that we have these, the Thor 3 programs, I remember. I had my last surgery in the hospital. The entire, my entire team that was going to work with me at Thor 3, the sports psych, um, the physical therapist, and the trainer all came to the hospital. Uh, we came up with a game plan right there, what we're going to do. Um, had my surgery. It was like Monday or Tuesday the next week um, in Thor 3, still with tubes and stuff. Had the drainage tubes still sticking out of me. And, you know, we're doing the training. I'm going to the physical therapist right afterwards, and then I'm working with the sports psych during the training and then afterwards, mm-hmm. too, for all the mental stuff. And I felt like they instantly just kept me in the game psychologically too. A, I wasn't hurting myself, but two, I also wasn't getting in the spot to where, you know, I was in some kind of negative space in my head. And I, and I think that's key because, you know, yeah. a lot of times when, when you find yourself in a black hole, like you're not going to get yourself out of that thing by yourself. It usually takes, mm. takes some help. Um, but even just, you know, getting ahead of the power curve. And even before that trip, my team was working with the, the cognitive, um, performance specialists all the time anyway. So I think that that really helped with everybody's mindset um, throughout everything. And you can even, when you're watching the video, you see how calm everybody is. Uh, I think that that's something that we didn't have back in the day. And I think it's pretty powerful. A lot of guys don't use it because you, know, you can't go online and, and show a picture of you flexing your, your brain or your autonomic nervous system, right? It's not, mm. it's not cool, but super powerful if you can if you can tap into that but as far as like the mindset thing like i don't know i've always been driven to almost too much just to like i when i get a goal in my head you know i've only got two speeds i got stop and go which mm. is not always a good thing uh, at all um but that's i don't know i've always had this philosophy that if you if you truly believe that you're this unstoppable force in nature in life then you will be obviously there's, there's other factors at play but you can only control what you can control and your mindset is something that you can control. So that's just something that I've always said, Hey, you know, regardless of outside any in, or influences, this is one of the things that I can control and I can control the way I think. And this is how I'm going to view my life and, and how I'm going to strive towards my objectives. And I felt it's pretty, pretty beneficial. That's one of the things that I think has helped me recover so many times. Like I just had my 30th surgery a year and a half ago. I have a lower back fusion and about to get it you know, hip replacement here, hopefully in June. But I think if, if you just, if you think that way and you're just super, I don't know, um, I guess a pain in the ass is the, the right word. Like yeah. you're just resilient. Yeah. Resilient is, is the good word, Chuck. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, 
I don't think I would have survived going through all the stuff you have gone through. Uh, I think basically any of those things, a lot of those things could have killed uh, a lesser man. Uh, but uh, something that I just, that resonated with me is, uh, you know, you've discovered new possibilities through this trauma. Mm-hmm. You found um, you're, you're able to uh, go a little further and, and deal with more each time you got hurt and you recovered, something like that. Yeah, I mean, even the hand, like the, the, the surgeon at Womack said, hey, there's no way we're ever going to be able to rebuild that. And I found a specialist on I mean, mm-hmm. Pioneers, he's like, yeah, I mean, it's always going to be jacked up, but we can rebuild it. But like, you look at my hand, like, I mean, there's a big scar and a missing knuckle, but, you know, I've gotten to where, you know, I can do everything with, with this hand again. And I think that that's just, you know, in your mind, you know, you're letting, you're always like, okay, there's no, there's nothing that's going to stop me yeah. um, from achieving this thing. And, you know, obviously things are going to stop you, but if, if you always striving towards that, like, I don't know if you ever heard of, you ever heard of a guy named um, Justin Manchika, Manchika, Manchika. Um, third group guy got shot through the head. Mm. So third group guy, he got shot through the head, like through the forehead out the back. And I remember the second time I was recovering, I I saw him in the gym, like right after probably a month after he got shot and he was like in there, like, you know, his arm doesn't work and he can't leave his leg. And, uh, man, that guy just never quit. He stayed in the army another three years. Um, he's doing like stem cell stuff right now, but you know, he's got, a lot of the use of his arm back. He actually, he, he couldn't talk very well. And he can actually talk pretty well again. Uh, but just, you know, that kind of mindset right there of, okay, well, the doctors pretty much tell me I'm going to be like a vegetable for the rest of my life, but not accepting that, you know? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm, I, you know, granted we've, we've come a long way as far as uh, the mental health aspect and uh, giving these guys, um, you know, the sort of the, you know, the counseling and, uh, you know, the psychological uh, treatment that a lot of these guys need after going through a traumatic incident. But I think there, there's something else that you're saying that's, that seems equally important, and I think it's finding a balance because it's really just getting right back in the fight, isn't it? I mean, isn't that a part of it as well? I mean, you know, you need all this, you need all this uh, therapy, you need all this uh, counseling, you need, you know, you need to put things in proper perspective. And I, and I understand the importance of that and not neglecting your mental health, but there, there's a huge sort of um, other part of that, which is getting right back in the fight. I mean, obviously that's something you wanted to do. I mean, that, you know, there was like, there was nothing keeping you from doing that. That, that's, that, that seems to be part of that sort of mental healing is, is trying to get back into that activity as quick as possible. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of you struggle with there too, because, you know, with traumatic injury, you're always going to want to, you know, heal and, and get better. Like way fashion is going to happen. You have a lot of setbacks and then you always get that option. Like, damn, am I going to let this setback, you know, put me in the, in the pity party hole, or am I going to use this to learn? Like you're kind of saying earlier, the growth and, and learn from it. Right. It comes back to that mindset of failure and defeat. Like it's okay to fail. Like we all fail. In fact, I think that we have to fail on occasion and we have to have our egos checked. Mm. I think that's a healthy thing because it allows yeah. you to reset no and doubt. come back stronger, but don't, don't confuse that with defeat, right? You know, that's not being defeated. Now, if you're failing the same thing over and over again, because you're an idiot and you don't learn from it, that's a problem. But, mm. you know, even within yourself, you shouldn't have like a, a zero defect environment. Like you need to allow yourself to fail and it's healthy. Like, and sometimes if you're like, man, I'm feeling really good. I'm awesome. Sometimes a failure is good because it, it reach it resets that ego. You don't want to start. You never want to start believing in your own hype. And, you know, a lot of really great officers and stuff. Man, at some point in their career, at that point, when nobody's being honest with them anymore, they start believing. Uh, you know, I've got I've come late. I just call like this dude's humping his own farts. Um, and then you know, they, they, they don't allow themselves to fail anymore either. So it gets real weird. But I think that that's a that's a healthy part. Like you fail, you grow from it. You know, he's like a phoenix, right? Like a phoenix rises from the ashes every time, comes mm. back stronger. But I think that's that's nature. Like life does that for you, and if you can accept it, um, you can always come back stronger. Mm. Hey, I wanted to ask you too, Chuck. If uh, let's just say that we had an extra phase of the Q course, and it was you know maybe a month long, and all the students just had a month with Chuck Ritter, 
I mean, what would that? Uh, what would be some of the wave tops of that? What would be what would that the phase, curriculum? What would that phase be about? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Chuck Ritter phase. What would what would be some of the, or maybe just something like this? Uh, you got guys going through the pipeline, and you're seeing trends, and you could just address all the guys going through the queue and just say, "Hey, look, here's a couple things that I'm seeing, and I would like to be correct. I would like to have corrected. Maybe something like that." Yeah, just be going back to the basics, right? Like, I even think like even SUT we screw up a little bit because we teach, oh, this is the soft way of doing it. But the reality is, I, you know, I started out in the infantry, but in my entire career in 13 combat deployments, I had never found anything sexy or a special technique or the secret to whatever that ever topped the how powerful the use of basic infantry doctrinal, doctrinal fundamentals are on the battlefield, like assault support security, using the main effort, um, a supporting effort in the reserve, you know, increasing the distance between two maneuver units when you expect to make contacts, you know, two elements decisively engaged. So, you know, like basic stuff like that, the basics of, you know, old 7-8, what's now 321-8 and dash 10 company level maneuver stuff. I think like that's the stuff, if you can key on that stuff and you get really good at the basic, basic stuff, like mm. that's where you make your money. Like even rifle marching shit, like, man, take that Gucci shit, put it off the side, get really good iron sights first. And then once you're good at that, then you can put that stuff on there. But, you know, really taking fundamentals and basics and making those important to to you and then constantly learning too mm. and realizing that you know every day that you come to work in special operations you got to earn that tab you got to earn everything you do and nobody gives nobody cares what you did yesterday you could have been awesome yesterday last week but what people care about is what are you bringing to the table right now today like what are you still confident right because Everything's perishable. Even even wiping your ass is perishable. As I found out twice. You know, I had to really not use my hands twice. And the first time, if you're getting shot in the back, you know, it's been three months since I got wiped with, with my right hand. I was like, man, I think I can do this now. And I went in there a little bit, way too cocky. Um, I was like, yep, I've been doing this my whole life. I don't need to like take this slow. I'm like, nope, fingers in the wrong place, disaster, right? And then for some reason, when I got shot through the hand, same thing. I was like, nope, just going in live. I got this. You know, same thing. Even wiping your own ass. Is a perishable skill, um, yeah. and that's one of the things I see in the regiment right now. Is like, hey guys, like you got to constantly revisit these these skills that you think might be simple, but make sure you can do it now. And then do it under stress. Like, yeah, okay, you can put that tourniquet on, and you put that tourniquet on under stress, and that, that Velcro quickly becomes really hard to manipulate when all your stress hormones are pumping in your body, and it it's, it lowers your IQ. Right when when stress hormones pump in your body, your IQ is lower, and you start losing. Um, your tactical, your, your technical skills, mm. um, you know, your finite motor movement, stuff like that. But, but just like, hey guys, like even the simple stuff, like practice it over and over again, and then practice it under stress, because that's what that's what you make your money on the battlefield. It's not all the advanced skills and all the sexy stuff and shooting at twenty five meter range. Um, that's what we go over, and then we go over like mastering your autonomic nervous system, right? Your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system, because you can you can train that. To where you can instantly bring your heart rate down, um, you know, and, and, and really physically control your, your heart rate variability to where you can be really stressed out. You can bring yourself back to a level to where you can get on the radio and make proper calls or do something like where you got to think through something. Um, and that's a learned skill. It takes a little while to do it. Um, you know, that's that's one of the, that's what the Thor 3 program, one of the big events taught me and, and our team is going through all those drills like how do you control your psychological nature uh, and you can do it and again it's not one of those things where you can flex it online so a lot of people aren't bought into it but when you do that i call it like just building a kill switch in yourself you can almost turn stress off no matter what like the world can be burning around you you can grab that radio you can sound super calm on it or you can make super calm on emotional decisions in the battlefield uh, mm -hmm. but i guess that's what we spend that month on is basics and then you know just the proper mindset like hey man like you got to earn that tab every single day. Like just because you did something cool doesn't doesn't mean anything. Like I'm a, I'm a sergeant major with a bunch of you know combat ribbons on my uniform, but nobody cares. What people care about is what am I doing for the academy every day I show up to work. And if I come in, I'm a turd. So I'm a turd. It doesn't matter what I did yesterday. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So what I hear you say is, uh, you know, there is a, a misnomer out there that 
there's uh, advanced shooting skills or advanced tactics and there's advanced planning. It's just basics, just just executing the brilliance of the basics uh, under stress. I'm ripping off another little bit of a quote there. But uh, that that is uh, something I've seen in, uh, as a trend. Uh, what about uh, as far as like leadership goes? What would you what could you say to guys out in the regiment right now? Guys that maybe you know, have been out there for a little bit, and maybe you see some trends. And uh, when when it comes to leadership, I know you had a couple of really good podcasts on the the Pinelander um, Underground uh, about that. Maybe just a couple of takeaways from that. Yeah, so leadership, everybody's always looking for the secret, right? And there's plenty of people make a ton of money giving speeches and selling books. And, you know, I try to keep up. I read most of them. But the reality is it's not that complicated um, in, in leadership. There's a couple of trends I see lately is, you know, if, if you ever go to with, with cover your ass leadership stuff, that's always a choice. Like you never have to do that. Um, and that's when you're making decisions to, that are in your best interest and not in the best interest of your soldiers of the unit. But the reality is like you can boil the secret to leadership is really simple. It's being competent in what you're doing and, and caring. And, and as a leader, like you don't have to like all the guys you that you're in charge of, like you get to care about them. You don't have to like some of the missions that you're being given. Right. But you're in the army. You still have to care about doing a good job. Um, you don't necessarily like the unit you're in at the time, but you still have to care about it. Um, and that, that equals trust. Like if you see your leader, and you get a leader that cares a lot, but he's not competent, you're not going to trust that dude, right? Or if you get a leader that's really competent, but you know he doesn't care, he just cares about himself, you're not going to trust that dude. But if you got somebody that's competent and they care, that's going to equal trust. And that's that's what leadership comes down to right there. Like you're, the people that are under you know that you know, you're going to do what's right, regardless of the consequences. And you're always willing to, to, to burn in and fall on your sword and, and die on that thing for what you believe is right. And you care about them, you care about the organization, and you care about the mission given to you. Regardless of you think that's a stupid mission or not, or whatever, you're still going to care about it. You're still going to get those guys to the finish line, and you're going to take care of them in the process. Yeah, we had uh, we had an episode um, last week uh, where a guy was talking about um, some of the same things that you're talking about, and. What really struck out was really kind of just the humility aspect of leadership. And, uh, you know, I know while I was in, I think I, that was that was probably the part that I sucked the most at. Um, I think I was uh, really just caught up in, in, in my own hype and my own ability. And really, you know, it wasn't until some maturity and, you know, really getting kind of knocked down a little bit that you kind of realize it's really not about you at all. Uh, it's it's about it's about everyone else and trying to help them uh, on their journey being as good as they can be, uh, which is really I think uh, really what you're saying too. I mean you you, know, you have the you have the unit mission you have uh, you have the group of guys you're with you know none none of these personal uh, feelings about these things matter. It really has to do with um, you know, humbling yourself, quieting yourself, understanding you got a job to do, being professional and helping these guys be the best they can uh, be uh, in, in, in accomplishing that. Um, but I know for myself, it wasn't something I probably didn't even figure out until I was probably retired, if we want the truth about it. Yeah, and that's the tough part. And the, you know, the humility part is, is, is really key, right? And there's, there's a fine line between confidence and cockiness. And it's, you know, it gets hard as a Green Beret. But you don't want to go into that cocky. You want to be a little cocky, but not too cocky. And then you're right. It's, it's not about you anymore. You're just a conduit. Like it's once you fall into a leadership position, it's not about you anymore. Um, it's about the mission unit and and those under you, and that's it, right? And, and you should always be willing to sacrifice yourself and everything else for those things. And if you're not willing to do that, then maybe you don't need to be in that position, right? Because if you're the guy that's not willing to do that, people are going to see it. And they might not tell you to your face, but they're going to talk behind your back like, yes, yeah, guys, you know. Now, you're He's, right now, you're really at a, at a key place um, as far as like, uh, you know, you know, the uh, the NCOES, right? The Non-Commissioned Officers Education System. I mean, you're mm-hmm. you have a lot of contact right now um, with sort of um, that uh, 
level of non-commissioned officer that's really kind of going from a junior NCO to a senior NCO, um, really where they're going to be uh, placed under a lot more, uh, res- you know, have a lot more responsibility on them. Uh, how how good a job are we doing within our education system within the military of really trying to uh, instill these these virtues these attributes that we're talking about? I mean, our NCO academy is a little bit different than the regular army, obviously because we deal with special operations. But the cool thing about the academy is if, if you want to promote, like we start at the very beginning, like after you pass election, basically the course, right? All NCOs have to go through it, so we get our hands on them right there. Then when you want to promote to E7 as a PSY operator, you got to come through advanced leader course. Um, CA and SF don't have a, an ALC, but if you want to promote to E7, you have to come back to our doors. So we have to we get our hands on it. If you want to promote to E8, you have to come back to our doors. And I say that, you know, when I went to what was ANOC back in the day, which is a senior leader course now, I, I thought the POI sucked. It was, I mean, there were some good things in there. I did learn a lot, but it was like five months long. Um, the POIs right now are, incredible i think the cadre and the first emergency branch chief man they've done an incredible job of really honing the, the pois into where it, they're probably the best they can get with the limitations that we do have by the army and everybody else um you know and it, it's like we're not really trying to instill attributes in, in the basic leader course we are a little bit but the way we look at it right now is like take the senior leader course for example uh, you know, before that, you know, as an E5 and an E6, the, the Army expects you, at least in soft, to be really good at your individual job. You know, your individual skills, you know, being a good Bravo, being able to use your heavy weapon systems, being a really good chess piece. And then when you promote to E7, the Army, it's not, it's not an entitlement, right? The Army's paying you more money because they want you to take on more responsibility. But more importantly, this is the Delta where you need to take a step back now. If you want that extra money, you want that extra responsibility with E7, it's not, you're not entitled to make that right, right? You can you can decline it. Now you need to start understanding the rules of the game a little better so you can start being a chess player, so you can maneuver multiple pieces around. And, and some some of the rules of the game is, you know, it's, it's that knowing what's in the box, right? A lot of guys say, oh, we don't operate in the box. We're, we're, we operate outside the box because we want special operations, which is true, but you still need to understand the box. Uh, and the rules within it, because a lot of those rules do work. Like we talked about earlier, the basic entry tactics and, and whatnot. And then when they don't work, you can be innovative and operate outside the box. But if you don't understand the box, you're not being innovative. You're literally just making stuff up and relying on your own innate genius and, and ability to reinvent the wheel. But that's what we're trying to teach you guys now in, in the senior leader courses. Here's the rules of the game. Here's the box. If you want to win and dominate any game in life, the first thing you have to do is read the damn rules and understand them. Because if you just walk up to a game Monopoly, you're like, well, I'm not going to read the rules. I'm just going to be innovative. We're going to lose, and you're just going to piss everybody off. Right? You're not going to win. Um, our job is no different. It's a game. You have to know the rules of the game if you want to dominate the game, especially post GWAT, where it's a more resource constrained environment and missions are scarce. So if you want to win, you want to get ammo, and you want to get, you know, risk under underwritten by the commander, and you want to, you know, six teams in the company at least competing. You need to play the game a little bit better. So that's what we're teaching is here's here's the rules of the game when it comes to national strategy. A better understanding of land commission warfare and planning, uh, but more importantly, like your unit training management stuff, and really getting all that into dudes' heads, so when they come out, they can actually be that chess player, and they can play the game more effectively. And then when they're coming back to the master leader course, that's where we want you to take an even bigger step back, and now think at the operational strategic level, like how do you become a chess master at this level so you can play the game, um, you know, more as an expert, you know, because I mean leadership, like you can't really teach leadership in two or three weeks like the master of the course is not a thing if you, if you don't have that coming in there's nothing we can do for you anyway uh, but we can teach you all the tools that you need to to apply it mm. probably way too long of an answer what you're looking for but. no that's uh mm-hmm. actually that's that's all really great information and uh, you know because i've been out a while obviously um you know it's really good uh, it, it, you know it's enlightening for me kind of seeing what uh you know, the big steps, because uh, I think there's a lot of good things going on in the military. Um, and, and, and one of the things, of course, is the mental health part. I'm really glad to see that. And you talked about the uh, leadership aspect. Uh, transitioning, I think that's something that uh, the military has done, you know, huge improvements on uh, since, uh, since my time. Uh, so a lot of these things, I think, uh, we're going in the right direction. Um, what I like to here right now is is kind of where do you think uh, 
the soft community really needs to sort of be focusing on. So you're 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 that guy. You know, you're down there. You know, you're a team sergeant. You're a team leader, um, and you're you're pulling out your crystal ball, and you're trying to kind of figure out what what type of training uh, do you need to be sort of focusing on as a team because this is kind of what the type of missions that you see coming down the pike. Yeah. So oddly enough. I've been paying really close attention to a lot of the exavals in the past four years between civil affairs, SIOP and, and, um, or SF. And it's not like the, the bigger important stuff that's really killing teams. It's, it's going back to, we talked about that basic stuff, guys blowing off planning and rehearsals and not having SOPs and stuff like that. Your basic stuff. Um, you know, but conversely, I mean, like people need to really start looking at Ukraine and, and the lessons you can learn from that war now and, and what the modern battlefield looks like, you know, in, in the GWAT area, Arrow, Iraq, Syria, like, and we're out in the sniper high position, like we dominated that train. We're not worried about people finding us. But that's not the case over there. Like now you have to worry about your signature, thermals, everything else. Uh, imagine like what, what are your trails? Like, you know, there's the Russians and the Ukrainians striking each other just by like, okay, well, here's a track that goes here. So something has to be in that wooded area. Simple stuff like that. Like, what does your signature look like between not just your physical signature, but your electronic signature and getting back to like using camo nets and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so we had to be prepared to work in a very technologically, um, I don't know, condensed environment where you have all this technology, but like I found in Syria as a task force cell major there, you also have to be able to operate in an environment where you're jammed out of everything. I remember we took uh, a couple teams to Alaska and we did a training event up there. Uh, they've been using all their sexy ATACs and GPS and all this stuff. And we, we brought one of the cyber training people up there and we just jammed everything. And one of the teams is out, like about to hit their target. Um, and now they didn't have GPS. Uh, they, they didn't bring any paper map backups. They didn't bring compasses. Uh, they're like, oh shit. I'm like, well, I mean, you got to figure this out, right? And they don't, they learned their lesson, right? Like, oh, we got to Syria. That's the way it was. The Russians were jamming us. Um, they were jamming our satellites specifically too. So you had to go through your entire contingency plan for communications, for navigation. So you have to be able to operate archaically still, and then be able to operate with all this technology that you have, um, which gets really difficult. And I, I don't know, like, I feel like we had it pretty good back when we were in, because we didn't have to worry about a whole lot of stuff. Now the stuff that the guys have to comprehend and be able to do is, it's it's overwhelming. I, man, I got a lot of respect for the guys in the current force, because they have to do far more than we ever did. They have to be proficient at things that I'm probably not even smart enough to be proficient in. Uh, but so, so guys need to do two things. They need to really make sure that they don't get focused on the shiny object and they're still concentrating on basic stuff. Basic. The, the teams that do the best at these events are the ones that have very solid practice SOPs. They have great planning SOPs and they go through it and they do the rehearsals. Um, and they can easily switch to, you know, compass and maps if they have to or, or paper and they can also use their, their technology, but they just, they train over and over on basic, basic stuff. And they're really good on it, good at it. So they're just on autopilot, um, you know, and they, they plan out really good contingencies and they practice those contingencies. So everybody knows like, Hey, okay, this, this happened. This is what everybody's going to do. Uh, I think yeah. those are the key things right now. Right. And then, you know, as far as like the future, like we're going to get more and more savvy on drones and, and how to reduce our signature on the battlefield and it's gonna be tough like the stuff going on in ukraine that's that's a very violent mind-blowing you know battlefield yeah it's, it's kind of it's kind of like a mix between like modern technology and world war one trench warfare yeah. i mean it's just mm -hmm. it's such a it's such a strange uh uh sort of uh um you know theater over there you know just the, just the way uh it's kind of developing and of course, it's not new. It's been going on for a while, but we're just—it's gotten everyone's attention now. Yeah, Dude, it's it's yeah, it's the stuff. I mean, there's some pretty good stuff too. If you guys want to, Rusi R U S I is a it's a think tank, and they published a really in depth study on the first. I think they went through the first five or six months of the war. I mean, there's a lot of good nuggets that come out of there that you can you can kind of put in your training plan. Just like when, if you're going to come up against a a peer, near peer adversary. Um, and it goes through like a lot of Russia's players too, like how, you know, they really screwed their initial planning, but you can take those lessons. Like, okay, well shit, like this is real. Like 
the stuff that's getting teams at XFLs now and on a bigger level that hit Russia in the ass too. So like, just don't do that shit. Like, um, you know, don't do the, Oh yeah. The, the, you got a couple different things you can do. You can go YOLO or you can like use MDMP and everybody says, like, Oh, MDMP is this complicated thing. Like, bro, it's seven easy steps. Like when I'm flying to California, I'm using MDMP. I don't even know. Like if I'm flying to California and I stop in Dallas, Texas, get off the plane. It's a connection. Oh man, I gotta go to the bathroom, receive the mission, right? And then I'm gonna do some mission analysis. I'm like, okay, where am I? Where am I gonna go? Is there a bathroom? Do I have enough time? And I'm gonna give myself a little brief back in the mission analysis brief so I know what's going on before I give myself some trainer's intent. Like, okay, I know what's going on. I know that my intent is to use the bathroom here, go in there, throw on some courses of action. You know, there's a big dude in this bathroom with a toilet paper. Oh, there's a pistol with a toilet seat here. Like, oh, here's a clean with toilet paper. War game. This is the this is the the right course of action here. I'm not going to produce an order, but I'm going to produce something. Boom, I just did MD, MDMP, right? It's a logical thought process to go from point A to point Z so you don't forget anything and how you're thinking through a problem set. Um, the people are like, oh, just, they just blow that stuff off. Like, it's not that complicated, man. It's literally seven seven steps. It's, you get, I hear it all the time. Like, well, why don't we use a better way? I'm like, okay, well, well, what's the better way? Brief it to me. I've been asking people that for 10 years. Uh, I had Kyle Lamb, um, you know, ex- Delta operator was in Mogadishu. His whole book disparages on MDMP. So I, I'm friends with him. I called him out on it. He's like, no, we'll use bottom up planning over the unit. I'm like, well, walk me through bottom up planning. Like, you know, get together. We'll, we'll throw us some courses of action. I was like, okay, well, first of all, you probably like look at the order and figure out what you're being asked to do, right? Like, yep. You make sure everybody understands what you're being asked to do. <laughs> yep. Okay. And then you probably, you know, brief a concept to the boss, right? Like, yep. And then you come to detail planning. You do some you do like, yep. I was like, that's in DMP, Kyle. Like, here's a step. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah, he's just what? been out of it. He, he's been over. He was over there too long <laughs> or long yeah. enough to kind of forget yeah. that we call it that. But yeah, he, so he, was, he actually. He's like, You're right. He's like, man, you need to write a book on this. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, Kyle's good people. Hey, uh, and then, you know, having just, uh, you know, let's just say hypothetically, I went through, you know, the Chuck Ritter final phase of the queue. I, I picked up on this. Uh, don't have a self-limiting mindset. You know, I think that that one could could crush you. And if you're the type that type of guy, uh, you, you may not do well. You know, somebody that uh, you know that has a mindset. Uh, they they say uh, that weapons change, but warriors don't. I think that's true also. So we have we have a certain class of uh, of you know guy that comes you know uh, towards towards the queue. And, uh, you know, he's uh, he's going to have that particular type of mindset. The other thing I heard was just, you know, practicing the basics and understanding the basics, practicing the basics. And, uh, you know, we say that a lot in the queue also is uh, uh, just a rip off. Um, I think it was uh, Brian Searcy's quote, uh, brilliance in the basics. And he might have yep. stole it from somebody else, but that's really it. I mean, we just do the good. We do the basic stuff well. You know, reps. Yeah, you, can, you can figure out impossible stuff. I remember, I, I remember all the way back in Robin Sage. One of the best lessons at Robin Sage is, and I thought my cadre was a dick, right? But like, man, he ran us through some stuff. Um, you know, one point he's like, "All right, Chuck, you're the team leader. You got these two guys." Um, you know, I forgot what role he was playing. He was like Jimbo or something. He's like, "I'm going to drop you off here. There is a radio station tower. I want you. You're going to observe it for three days, and you're going to blow it up." and you know, he may go through a planning process and we had to like meet some dude and go through all of our stuff. But he dropped us off. He's like, all right, here you go. And I'm like, look at the map. I was like, I don't know where this is. He's like, you're about six kilometers north of the map. I'm like, well, can you show me like where, right or left? He's like, nope. <laughs> you're going to yeah. figure it out. So then we're like, all right, well, we know we're six kilometers north. So we start walking south. But, um, you know, it made us think like, okay, let me go back to all the bases of land navigation. We're like, okay, here's an intersection. We're at six kilometers. Like, okay, we are right here, right? And then just going through all that basic stuff. They didn't give us any food or anything. So we had to, like, figure all that stuff out out there and dig ourselves a little hide site. Um, you know, and then, of course, like, on purpose, like, the guy didn't pick us up, so we're stuck out there for, like, an extra day and a half and, like, you know, procuring our own water. Mm. Um, you know, basically, he's putting us in an impossible situation, which it wasn't impossible. You know, we had Wayne walking everybody with us. Um, he was laughing his ass off the whole time because he had shadow in his backpack. Um, but just making us figure it out. But you're just going back to the basics, like you know, there was nothing sexy that we did up there. We just 
had to rely on the basic stuff we were taught and we were successful with that mission. <clears throat> hey, so what are, what are you working on now? What's the, what's the next thing on the, what's like the five minute target for you? Oh man, I got so many targets. <laughs> um, it's like a project. Got, or something. I'm, I'm, I'm involved with the regular warfare initiative. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're yeah. um, at a West Point in person. I, I work development for them. We just, we just had a meeting while ago. Do that. I'm on the, I'm on the board of directors for a couple of nonprofits. Uh, if you ever get a chance, check out Challenge Reach Foundation. Uh, you know, it's, it's all military guys. What sets us apart is the, the whole thing is run. Uh, we're, we're run by people that have been through traumatic stress and, and mental stuff. And basically, what we do is we vet people through the SOCOM Care Coalition that are going through some serious problems and they get away. And then we fly in first class to Montana and we hang out there with a ski and a snowmobile. And we bring professionals out there too to go through all the mental health stuff that you need to, to cope that doesn't have to do with drugs. They're going through everything that you need to do to, to manipulate your own autonomic nervous system to where you, know, you, you can kind of cope and control yourself without freaking out. And and then we keep up with them. If they need you know help after that, uh, we work with them. Um, but that's that's pretty awesome. And then we got Dreams for Low Mattress here too. I serve on their, their board. Ben Keith Moneymaker locally. He owns a furniture store, but uh, he takes beds and stuff and, you know, gives those in need, like just had a guy had a back surgery, um, got him an adjustable mattress, you know, free of charge, you know, SF guy, stuff like that. Um, he's helping people out where they need, where they need help. And then working on my plans for retirement. You know? mm, fantastic. Yeah. And if, uh, listeners, you can go to, uh, just go on YouTube. You got a, a bunch of, uh, great videos. I know you had one I really liked a lot. It was uh, where well, you're surrounded by the Taliban. It's awesome. The Black Rifle Coffee Company one. Uh, yeah, and then you had uh, what's that? Go ahead. No, oh, no, that was it. Okay, and then you have the the one of recruiting and training, and then uh, you know the one about the Tagab Valley. But uh, you know, having uh, you know known a little bit more about your your story, I heard about your story before, but uh, you know, it's awesome to hear. Uh, you know, a guy like you and how humble you are too. You know, you're not a guy that's, uh, you know, full of yourself. It'd be hard for you to walk through, uh, through a door. You know, sometimes a guy's head so big, you can't get in the room, but that's always yeah. good. And I would just say that, uh, uh, I know that I think you're also one of the guys when Nietzsche was talking about that, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So it's always yeah. good to, to hear that, you know, very positive, uh, guys, you're hearing this. Uh, check them out on the on YouTube. A lot you can learn from Chuck, and I've learned a lot myself. I appreciate you coming on the podcast today, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. Right, thanks, Chuck. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Pine Lander Podcast. If you enjoy our unique content, please consider supporting our sponsors, Soft News, providing special operations news around the world. It's where Paul and I go to keep abreast of what's going on within the soft community. Check them out at soft.news. Blacksmith Publishing. Been serving the warrior class since 2013. They have great titles written for warriors, by warriors. If you're looking for excellent reference material or just want to unwind with a great novel, be sure to check out the bookstore located at blacksmithpublishing.com. And if you're looking for some cool Pinelander apparel, Head on over to the General Store, located at PinelanderGeneralStore.com. That's all one word, PinelanderGeneralStore.com. Have a great selection of shirts, hats, jackets, sweaters, stickers, patches, artwork, and a whole lot more. Check out the store at PinelanderGeneralStore.com. If you're interested in helping develop our country's next generation of warriors, uh, please consider donating to the American Agogi Project. The mission of the project is to foster an environment producing able-bodied citizen warrior men of fine character. And we'll be officially launching the project in 2023 in celebration of uh, Blacksmith Publishing's 10th anniversary. Until our next meeting, stay mentally and tactically smart, physically and spiritually strong, and socially astute. To each other, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. May God continue to bless Pineland.